Good evening to everybody who is here. I am based out of Miami, so you guys were really challenging me with this cold. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. Um, and for those of you that are tuning in remotely, thanks for joining us as well. My name is Katie Fang. I am the host of The Katie Fang Show on MSNBC. I am also a legal analyst um, and a legal correspondent for the network. It is my honor to be moderating our next panel, as you can see. Thank gosh for the large font for me getting older. Uh, the abortion voting rights connection. So it's tough to follow the panel that we just did, uh, but it's amazing how absolutely relevant the dialogue and conversation that we just listened to with the first panel is to what we're going to be talking about right now. But I'm going to actually introduce the panelists right now. I would urge all of you to take the time at your leisure to please go check them out, their bios, their backgrounds, because it's a pretty spectacular group of women that we have right now. To my immediate right is Deir Deirdre Schiefling. Um, and again, uh, just an amazing group of people here. In the middle is Lourdes Rosado. Mucha gracia, lo al español, yo al español. And then at the far end, we have Gretchen Borschelt. And you can see what their titles are based on the screen behind us. But let's just get into the panel now. So Deirdre, I really would love to start with you. Um, the first question that I want to pose to you is the following, which is, despite the best efforts, many states have a very long history of voter suppression. And, and, and I find that the voter suppression usually starts percolating around some key hot button issues and topics, including abortion and reproductive rights access. So what impact is the voter suppression kind of movement having right now on reproductive rights? And more importantly, kind of as an overview generally for the people tuning in and watching, like where are we right now when it comes to that? What's the kind of uh, landscape that we're looking at right now? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, and um, thank you for that question. Um, I think the key ingredient here is really power, and we have to understand both the attacks on voting and the attacks on democracy, as well as the attacks on reproductive rights and all kinds of rights as being fundamentally about power. Um, and when you look at what the landscape is across the country in terms of uh, reproductive access, reproductive freedom, um, the states that have either entirely banned abortion or have severely restricted abortion, 26 states across this country since the Dobbs decision, um, those states track very closely with states that have restricted voting, restricted democracy, that have heavily gerrymandered state legislatures, that have other ways of um, really invalidating voters' voices in those states. And I think this is really dangerous. It's really dangerous um, for all the reasons that the panel right before us just said about the, you know, the lean towards might makes right, that kind of creeping authoritarianism. Um, you know, Jamel Bowie, the New York Times columnist, mm -hmm. had this amazing phrase in a column about a month ago that's really stuck with me. Um, as he describes these attacks on uh, democracy and really undermining the will of the voters. And, you know, the, the rolling back of reproductive rights is a great example of undermining the will of the voters. And that phrase is the cultivation of political despair. The cultivation of political despair. And I think that's really true and it really resonates uh, for me because it's a way of, at every turn, no matter what voters say, despite the fact that two-thirds of voters in our country support reproductive rights, support access to abortion, um, at every turn, um, the majorities of you know, largely Republican legislatures in state after state, in the Supreme Court, right now in our House of Representatives, move to invalidate what those voters want and throw up obstacles for those voters to make their voice heard. Um, and that really leads folks to the logical conclusion that nothing they do matters. Um, and I think that is, that is the cultivation of political despair that we have to fight against uh, tooth and nail. So Lourdes, we were speaking before the panel started about how sometimes it's not that we have a want of empathy, but sometimes if we speak frankly, 
Sometimes we have to have an impact for us to want to experience and to have the change. Sometimes we have the luxury and the privilege of being able to sit where we are and not be directly impacted. Um, I really wanted to kind of drill down and have you give an example, a case study for in real life of somebody who has been directly impacted by the draconian attacks and the abortion bans that we've been seeing so that maybe just in a minute that people could maybe sense exactly how much of an impact there has been on individuals because it's not just voters amorphously. These are real people that are being directly impacted by these laws. Yes, thanks so much, Katie, and thank you. I love the um, what you were saying earlier, Deidre, about it. It's about power and those in power not wanting to give it, give it up. I mean, we've been working. Our advocacy is really focusing on showing how women of color are going to be disproportionately impacted by by these abortion bans. That, um, in fact, it's not only impacting their reproductive health, which in and of itself is 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 vital, but also their economic stability and their economic mobility. I mean, right now, like more than 60% of those who are seeking abortion in this country are women of color, and about half of them live below the poverty line. Um, you know, and just looking at Latinas, for example, um, there are about 58% of Latinas in the United States are of childbearing age, and that compares with only 38% of white women who it's almost a 20 point differential and it will also only grow in the future as the Latino population has continued to grow. And so many of them live in those 26 states, right? There's something like 43% of all Latinas of in childbearing years live in those 26 states. So they are being, they are being directly affected. So we've been um, approaching this at Latino Justice as an issue not only of reproductive rights, but of economic justice um, for our population. And recently we got involved in the challenge to the Florida 15-week abortion ban, HB5, um, and wrote an amicus brief of, along with some other groups who really serve this population and featured the story of a woman who we'll call Alma, who was a, a, who's a Latina Floridian who was directly impacted by the ban. She, um, was unable to obtain abortion care because of it and was forced to travel out of state at a substantial personal cost and financial cost to get this abortion. Even though her fetus had a life-threatening health condition and she had a previous medical condition, underlying condition that really risked her own health if she continued the, the pregnancy, but the doctor's office would not, um, would not assist her with the abortion for fear of this law. Um, of being prosecuted under this law, and you know, Alma was from a, uh, is a working class um, family. She's a working class family who has limited income, and this really had a devastating impact on her. And Gretchen, one of the things we just heard from Lourdes is that her organization filed an amicus brief or an amicus brief, right? And I wanted to have the next kind of conversation with you for this panel about the role of the judiciary. We heard in the previous panel exactly, you know, an activist, jurist, or judiciary and what they can singularly accomplish when they're hell-bent on doing it. But when we talk about voting rights and we talk about access to voting, inevitably it brings up conversations about redistricting and gerrymandering and the ability to, to cheat what the electorate wants. But in the context of voting rights, we've seen what happens with the overturning of Roe v. Wade with the Dobbs decision. We now know that the Supreme Court has taken up one of two appeals for Mifepristone, the abortion pill. I mean, it is a never ending, never ceasing attack on reproductive rights. I wanted to ask you about how we're supposed to watch the judiciary be so actively involved on such a personal and intimate part of our lives. Yeah, it, well, first of all, thanks for having us. Thanks for hosting this panel. Um, I mean, it's it's dire. It's dire in the courts for reproductive rights. I don't think we can sugarcoat it. Um, the federal courts have been, because of you know restrictions on voting rights, we have people in the Senate who are voting for judges who have extreme anti-abortion records and were cherry-picked for that particular reason. 
got confirmed and are now in these courts across the country, in federal courts across the country. And you mentioned the Mifepristone case. So this is a case that is going before the Supreme Court that will decide whether people will continue to have access to medication abortion, one of the two pills that's used most commonly for medication abortion, which is over half of abortions in this country. And the in that case, the organization that brought this case was created in order to challenge the case. It was a made up organization. They picked a district that they would be in Texas for this particular judge, Judge Kazmarek in Amarillo, Texas is the sole federal judge there. And so they incorporated this organization so they could get to this judge who then decided to eliminate access to this safe an effective method of medication abortion that's been used for over 20 years. That decision was stayed, so it's, it's, it's still status quo right now for medication abortion, but it's now going to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court is going to hear this case this term. The Supreme Court's also gonna hear a case about access to emergency care for people who need abortion in emergency situations. And this is another case that shouldn't be before the Supreme Court, because in that case, it was in Idaho, and the Biden administration said, we have a federal law called EMTALA that guarantees access to emergency care for people who need it. And that overrides your Idaho state ban, which has no exceptions. And Idaho said, no, 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 we're gonna defend that with the help of a very conservative anti-abortion organization. They're defending that law. The district court stayed that law and the Supreme Court decided to come in and let the law go into effect and is hearing that case even though it hasn't been heard by the next level court. So the Supreme Court, which I should add, said in Dobbs, the reason we're, part of the reason we're overturning this Roe v. Wade decision is because it's led to all this litigation. For all of these years, we've had all this litigation and this is gonna put an end to it. It's just gonna be decided by states. Well, now we have two cases going before the Supreme Court, um, you know, just barely, not even two years after that decision. So um, the judiciary has a goal. It has a goal along with anti-abortion activists, which is to end the use of abortion in this country. And I think we're seeing that play out in these court cases. I also think we're seeing it play out with the ballot initiatives across the country. Um, because now that people are starting to vote in favor of abortion access, when it's put to voters, not when it's put to state legislators who gerrymandered the, the, you know, the elections and the voting so that they would stay in power, when it's put to the voters and they decide to protect abortion access, what we're seeing now is Abortion, anti-abortion activists change the rules, attack democracy, change the ballot initiative process, do whatever they can to stop it so that they can overturn the will of the voters and stay in power. Back to Deirdre's point. And, and Deirdre, that's my next question to you. Why is the electorate getting it so wrong, though? Because if the numbers objectively justify the decisions to be done, which is to allow people to have the individual decisions, the independence to be able to decide for themselves that they want to have access to reproductive rights. What, what's wrong? What's the disconnect between what the electorate is doing versus what the public wants them to do? Yes, I mean, I think, I think you're hitting the nail on the head here, which is that the elected officials are not acting in the interests of their voters of their citizens. Um, and I think we saw, you know, in ballot initiative, every single ballot initiative in this country, all seven that have been run since Dobbs have won, no matter what state, Kansas, Ohio, Michigan, you know, you name it, the, the voters have voted uh, in many cases overwhelmingly to protect reproductive freedom. And the ACLU has been a big part of most of those campaigns. Um, what's interesting is, um, that part of, I think, what is happening here is because of the gerrymandering, because of the lack of accountability um, of elected officials to their voters, like if, all, if the only election that an elected official needs to worry about is their primary, right, because their district is so gerrymandered, there's no hope of the other party winning it, they only have to worry about their primary, it really distorts their incentives in terms of governing. And it, and it makes, it, it creates sort of a, a race to the fringe or the race to the right, in this case, um, of the most extreme positions so that uh, they are in a, the best possible position to galvanize their very, very small base uh, of primary voters who they need to win their next election. Um, so in some sense, it's quite rational what state legislatures are doing. They are responding to the incentives that an extreme gerrymander has presented them with, which is to pander 
to the most right wing of their primary voters um, and sort of outdo themselves um, in their opposition to reproductive rights and other rights um, and liberties. So I think the solution to this um, is to restore fair districts, you know, restore voting rights, kind of go back to a system of government where we can actually hold those elected officials accountable uh, when they have positions that are out of step with what the you know, majority of voters in their state want. Go ahead, Gretchen. Yeah, I was just gonna build on what Deirdre was saying. I think one of the hopeful things about this ballot initiative effort is not only that they've succeeded in all seven states where they've been brought, but also the turnout, right? The turnout and the energy and the excitement, especially among young voters who are turning out for the issue of abortion, they are listing that as the reason they are out there voting. And we're seeing especially young people of color and young women are voting for these issues. And I think it's also demonstrated what we have known for a long time, but politicians have not believed, which is that not only that abortion is a winning issue, but it's actually a nonpartisan issue. That it's as an issue, it is attracting Republicans, it is attracting independents. People are voting for this issue. We wouldn't have had the success in the states where we've had it, like Kansas, like Kentucky, without that being true. So that is something that is bringing me hope in these dire times, um, and something that I think politicians are starting to wake up to, starting to wake up to. But I do want to ask you about Ohio, for example, though, because it took a two-step process to get there, though. It took the vote to be able to make sure that it made it to the ballot in the first place. Then it successfully passes in Ohio with a resounding number of people coming out to vote. But then the state legislature, the state legislature says, you know what, we're not even gonna abide by it. We're gonna try to pass another statute that says we don't even have to listen to what the law is. I mean, we're seeing the same thing in Florida, for example, where you got enough petition signatures to be able to get the ballot initiative on the ballot. And yet now we're waiting for the Florida Supreme Court to decide through its Republican attorney general whether or not the language is appropriate to even be on the ballot. I mean, it's not as easy as just getting people to say, this is what we want, and we're just going to get it there. Right? Yep. Yeah. That's, sorry. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was, like, that was a question. <laughs> and, but, just and just to build on that, like, yeah. there have been 150 pieces of legislation introduced in state legislatures across the country just in the past two years mm -hmm. to try to restrict this ballot initiative process. So only half the states in the country even have direct democracy, ballot initiatives as an option. Um, but that's right, this has been a new site of uh, contestation um, in terms of uh, the rights attempt to kind of circumvent voters and change the rules, raise the threshold, you know, uh, do everything they can to kind of throw up barriers um, to voters making their voice heard in that process. So in, in Ohio, that's right, we were very successful in turning out voters even in the you know, dead of August to defeat this attempt to raise the threshold to 60%, um, but it, it's never ending. After, after we, we defeated that and with lots of other partners, um, the next thing that the legislature decided to do was uh, voter purges yep. in right. advance of exactly. you know, November. And yeah. you know, just, it, it, you know, it never ends. Right. So I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I too was buoyed right, by the turnout, but I think we're all in agreement that voter suppression is alive and well. Um, and it's also targeted at groups that are not in power, right? Because they're, I, I, I work on behalf of the Latino community and I do a lot of, 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 of meeting with community um, activists and I always say, you know, who are like facing like voter purges and talking about, I, I was just thinking today about the 2020 midterms and this horrible photo that I saw of two armed men in mass standing side by, you know, on one side or the other of a ballot box out in Arizona. Um, again, a, a state with a high Latino population and just thinking about the everyday voter suppression that is happening. And I, I tell my, my colleagues, my, my community members, like, hey, they're, they're doing this because they're, they're scared of your growing power, right? They know that you are like 19% of the population now. Latinos are like one in four uh, youth under 18, so it's only going to grow. And they're trying to protect their power and privilege, and it really goes directly to your ability to, um, for economic mobility and education. Lourdes, you've got more than 25 years of deep involvement in the social justice landscape. 
what what lessons haven't been learned? The, the, the fact that we're having this conversation yeah. again, what lessons haven't been learned from what you've seen? Because you, you may have a focus in the Latino space, but mm-hmm. it's applicable to, to all communities, and especially those of color. Yeah, I, I think what is just surprising to me, we just um, celebrated my organization's 50th anniversary last year, and we had this wonderful opportunity. We did an oral um, history film, we had our three co-founders talk about, um, talk about in a documentary how they started the organization in its first years. And my God, the issues that they were facing 50 years ago, we're still facing now. You know, um, language access, for example, this is a huge issue, not only for the Latino population, but for many Asian communities in terms of being able to access the ballot. And we do a lot of work around language access. It's like whack-a-mole. I mean, there is more, um, more boards of elections around the country that are in breach of the federal requirements around language access that are really complying with it. And that was true to, you know, 50 years ago as well. And so it's sort of disheartening. But on the other hand, it's, um, it also makes me um, re, um, emphasize to people that it really is about the fundamentals that we really have to focus on sheer voter access, like are people actually being able to get to the court, to the polls physically? Are, are there issues around um, disability access, about language access? Is there voter intimidation? Is there misinformation? Oh my goodness, that is, um, I'm just really worried about that going into this election, how much misinformation is, is being generated. Yeah, and if I could just build on that, I mean, I think lessons that we are learning when it comes to abortion rights are very similar, that we had the right for a long time, but we didn't necessarily have access for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so as we think about what is the future of abortion in this country, we have to learn those lessons, that a right is meaningless if the access is not there, if it's not truly meaningful for people to be able to access it. And unfortunately, some of the same communities that Lourdes is talking about did not have true access. And that's partly because Roe was chipped away at for so long by Mm. these anti-abortion state legislators, by judges who allowed certain kind of challenges to to go forward and and chip it away. Um, But that's a real lesson for us too as a movement is how do we guarantee not just the right in the future, but access for everybody who needs it in a meaningful way without stigma, without barriers, Mm. without judgment. Deirdre, are we being naive in thinking that we're oversimplifying it by saying, oh, well, if if abortion's on the ballot, then that will guarantee a turnout when there's all of these intricacies that are involved when it comes to something as simple as access? Well, I think if if you are thinking about abortion politically, um, abortion is a hugely winning issue. And I will say that that was not always the case. Um, It was not such a salient electoral issue. It was not driving uh, vote choice for voters uh, prior to Dobbs. So when we had the right, people felt secure in the right, they didn't really vote on it. It wasn't, it was like, you know, five or six on the list. Now it's number one on the list uh, for many, many voters. And we have a 20 point advantage on it um, in terms of uh, generating voter turnout, young people, voters of color, actually voters of all kinds um, are animated by uh, abortion, voting for abortion access. It's not going to be enough to do that, though. Um, We need to elect candidates who support abortion access, and then we need to fight like hell to pass a federal bill that would restore abortion access across the country. We cannot do this whack-a-mole state-by-state campaign because of the gerrymandering, because of the voter suppression, This is a human right. It's a fundamental human right. We need to restore it at the federal level. Lourdes, uh, when there are so many issues, though, especially for certain communities, um, just for for example, for the Latino community, Mm -hmm. just even dealing with the immigration issues, for example, right? which are inescapable. And it's not just the Latinos, it's, it's, it's pretty much everyone that's trying to come to this country, right? But, but we'll focus on that. D- is abortion enough of an important issue though? I, I, I think it is. In, in the Latino community, it's so interesting because I think there's a, a trope out there that Latinos are Catholic, they're conservative. Um, I was talking with the head of a, uh, a Latino voter uh, engagement organization who had recently done some field polling and, and field work uh, focus groups and really actually a lot of Latinos 
um, have a strong sense of, of family privacy, um, what she was telling me, that uh, people like, you know, that's their, <laughs> that's um, that person's issue. We don't get, you know, we're not going to like, in, uh, so I think their sense of privacy is very strong, so I think it's important, but it's also, I think, when I talk with, um, with folks, I mean, the number one issue besides immigration in a lot of families, it's a big issue, is, is economic mobility. And when you, t when for, for so many Latino, uh, Latina-headed households, for example, are, you know, are pe earn pennies on the dollar of, compared to a white ma male-headed household, have pennies to the dollar in net worth of a white male, you know, compared to a white male household. For, for so many Latinas, uh, it's, a, it's an economic issue. It's like, when are they going to be able to how, you know, get an education and, 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 and pursue a career, pursue a job that will do more um, for their family. So I think when you, when a lot of Latinos look at it that way, which explains why I, you know, I believe there is strong support within the Latinx community for abortion rights. And, you know, Gretchen, objectively speaking, and putting aside, you know, any type of personal opinion I have about Matthew Kosmarek, for example, um, <laughs> what, when judges are sitting on the bench, ostensibly they are applying the law that is created by statute, which is done by legislators, right? I mean, is, is it necessarily the case then that the judiciary is the boogeyman here? And is it, is it just, is it wrong to be focusing on that if they are technically applying the laws that are on the books? Well, these judges are not applying the law in good faith in any way, shape, or form. And they're recognizing harms that don't exist and not mm -hmm. recognizing harms that, for example, pregnant people have, right? So they're trying to get to an outcome. Their decisions are outcome de determined. Um, but I should also say there are some good judges and good courts, and especially in state courts. You know, there are some really good existing state constitutional provisions that we and ACLU and others are trying to use to ground access to abortion care in other ways. Um, so, for example, we have a lawsuit in Missouri using the state establishment clause, and we brought it on behalf of a number of faith leaders who say that the state abortion ban violates their own beliefs, their own religious beliefs, that their religious beliefs foster and accept people's decisions to make for themselves about whether or not to have an abortion. And these legislators who are legislating their religious beliefs into law and banning abortion are violating the separation of church and state. And so that's an example. There are many others. We're trying to use provisions around the right to equality and equal protection for people, right? Because some of the reasons that Lourdes talked about, that it is an equality right, that you have access to abortion care so that you can succeed in your career, you can provide for your family, it's an economic issue, right? So there are many ways that we are trying to bring other challenges and other theories, legal theories that will ground the right to reproductive health care in new laws, and there are some judges that are open to it. There are some extreme ones who are not, but there are some who are open to it, and are, are thinking really thoughtfully about the law and how it can work in this circumstance. And so, Deidre, should that be the new framing then? Should the framing of the issue of abortion vis-a-vis -vis voting not be, quote unquote, just the abortion itself, right? Should it be the economic mobility? Should it be the equality conversation? Should it be the, nobody's talking about what happens if you have to have the child and the, you know, the economic pressures it creates because we don't have affordable childcare Right? I mean, is that the way that the framing should be done? That it kind of goes beyond just that initial kind of conversation about abortion. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that reproductive rights and making your own decisions about your own body is quite core to equality, mm -hmm. period. Agreed. And that we cannot have equality in our country when we have a group of people that cannot make their own decisions about their own bodies, period. Um, and so I think the, the point I would make is that actually uh, voting, democracy, protecting voting, protecting democracy um, goes hand in glove with protecting rights. Reproductive rights, LGBT right, whatever rights, they go hand in glove. And we cannot durably protect rights and liberties in our country without a representative democracy to do it. And so I see those fights as totally linked totally connected um, as key to getting past this point um, is, is linking those two fights. 
And Lourdes, do you think that there's being enough done to kind of uh, lift each other up when it comes to the different states and the different jurisdictions, the different communities, to make sure that these conversations are being had and that the education is being had so people understand exactly what is at stake? Uh, I, I think there's a lot going on. Um, a lot of um, my peer groups are doing amazing work, um, but there's more to be done. I, I think what we really have to do is is still remain incredibly vigilant around voter suppression tactics, as well as re, you know redistricting issues um, around gerrymandering. I mean, we're sitting in New York State. Our congressional district maps are being redrawn as we speak. Very much a live, <laughs> a live issue. And then we're going to have to really um, be, you know, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a whack-a-mole, but we do have to keep meaning every voter suppression or gerrymandered district with, with litigation and, and, and um, organizing to oppose it. Gretchen, do you think that, can you, do you want to add anything to what Lourdes just said about this idea that there needs to be maybe a, a, a bigger, thicker thread that's kind of connecting organizations and, and communities to make sure that the messaging is on point and that people truly understand what's at stake when they go to the ballot? Yeah, I mean, look, we have to battle a lot of misinformation and disinformation that has been really purposefully pointed around abortion and people being unsure and scared. And of course, now that abortion is illegal in some states, you have fear of criminalization and surveillance and being prosecuted. Um, and so that is a real fear for people day to day, not knowing if it's, if it's legal or not in their state, not knowing where they can turn, having questions that they can't get the right answers to. And there has been a campaign of misinformation by anti-abortion activists to keep people confused and scared and unable to assert their rights when they have them. One thing I will just let people know is there is a resource. We and ACL you and some other reproductive rights organizations joined together and launched something called the Abortion Defense Network. So if anybody needs legal advice or representation or financial assistance, we are there for them and we provide that to them free of charge. So just want to make sure people know that resources out there because we are trying in so many ways to work together to respond to this crisis that we have been put in by the Supreme Court. And that is an appropriate way to end this evening's panel. Thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for tuning in and listening. I appreciate it. Thank you.